And thank you very much for coming. And we really appreciate the great efforts from Sebastian and his team. And they're going to introduce the Precision House Data Resources, which will be a good and great resource for our teaching, uh, research, and even grant writing. So I'll hand the floor to Sebastian and he will introduce their team and their whole workshop, okay? okay. Again, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, thank you for being here. Um, this is a great turnout. Uh, Lou initially said, oh, we're going to get 30, 40 people. And I said, no way. 20 is going to be awesome. And we have almost 50, so I guess we both were wrong, kind of. Um, anyway, so uh, to give you a quick idea what we're thinking of doing today. Um, so the very beginning is going to be me just giving you a very, very big picture overview about what precision health is, what we want it to be, and what we're thinking about it. Then Chang is going to talk about actual biostatistics research that has happened with this data already, so that you can maybe situate it a little bit, because both mine and Chang's research direction is going to be a little bit genetics heavy, but um, I mean, there are many other applications there as well. Then Anissa, who is with us through Zoom, is going to um, give a presentation about um, the actual nuts and bolts, how you can get to the data, what all is there, how can you get to it. Then we're going to have a Q&A where um, Shang and me are going to be in the room to answer questions. And Anissa and Cynthia are online um, to, to help with anything we don't know, which is probably going to be a lot. And then in the very end, for people who really want to get their hands dirty right now, Anissa is going to run a tutorial to give you an idea. This is how you, if you now go to your computers, can directly get your hands on some of that data. Okay, cool. So to give you an introduction um, about uh, precision health, I actually want to start bragging a little bit on our biggest successes. So with the um, pandemic, you've probably all seen these pulse oximeters, right? Um, quite frankly, when the pandemic started, one of the first things I did is go out and buy these, buy one of these things because I thought this way I know when I have to go to the hospital or not. So it turns out when researchers from uh, the College of Engineering and the College of Medicine looked at data sets in our precision health data where they compared measures with a pulse ox meter with more invasive but more precise measurements, they found something rather unpleasant. They found that the quality of the measurements you get from the pulse ox meter depends on the darkness of your skin. In particular, in African individuals, the pulse ox meters were much less precise than in people of um, lighter skin, like people of European descent, which had the effect that your risk of failing to detect severe hypoxia was three times as high in the Africans relative to the Europeans. Right? And that is a severe problem. So this work was obviously published in New England, of New England Journal of Medicine, um, as I said, with contributions from multiple schools at the university. But what's much more important, it directly prompted um, members of the US Senate to work with the FDA to improve the requirements of how these pulse ox meters are designed and how they can be more equitable. Right? So, and this is, um, this is uh, pretty much in three of the four components that for me are the key goal of precision health research in Michigan. First one is we have a really large data set. So if we have a question, we don't need to collect data, we can go to the data and the data is there. Second is, is a collaborative effort. We can work across schools, across disciplines. We can have computer science uh, specialists, we can have medicine specialists, we can have statistics specialists and other public health specialists to help us um, analyze the data. Third one, that's the one that was not really relevant in this data set. There's a lot of support for advanced um, computational methods. Precision Health has its own computer cluster that is available to members free of charge. And finally, it actually matters. In the end effect, we can improve healthcare with what we're doing, right? These are for me the four main components here. So to forward these components, Precision Health was started by the university um, three, four years ago. As, an initial, as a presidential initiative, it is um, doing what I just described, and it's funded by uh, the College of Engineering, School of Public Health, and the main funders are the Office of the Provost and Michigan Medicine. And uh, to achieve these goals, it basically has a, oh yeah, one of the things I, I need to detail real quick, just because it's really easy to mix up, especially when you're here in the department, you might have heard GI, 
Michigan Genomics Initiative. And this is a small part of Precision Health. MGI is a subset of people who were specifically consented for research um, for whom we have uh, genetic uh, samples so we can generate genetic data and we have generated genetic data for a lot of those people. And what is really nice, we have permission to recontact them. So if you have a very good idea, it would be useful to get one more piece of information from them, we can actually go out and get that piece of information. Uh, Precision Health, on the other hand, is just the research data warehouse, which is basically contains all of the electronic medical records of the, um, of, of the, of the medical school, except anonymized and made available to the rest of the, to the, rest of the university. Um, okay, so as I was just saying, there are four main components to the, to, to the precision health effort. The first one is cohort development, which is led uh, by Bramar. And here the goal is primarily to um, inc increase who we have in MGI, particularly to make MGI more diverse. MGI so far has been very opportunistic in its sampling, which has the effect we're having a very unrepresentative sample. We want to make the sample more representative, and that's one of the main goals of cohort development. Um, data analytics and IT is all the computation part of it is on the one hand providing the infrastructure to do research, but also to develop new algorithms and to combine data sets that might not exist in this particular form. And Chang is uh, one of the leaders of that uh, effort here. The other two components is health implementation. As I said before, we want to actually affect healthcare. And the goal here is this is a work group that helps you create a procedure. If you have a finding how treatment should be modified to actually bring that into the clinic. And finally, we have education and training. This here is part of education and training, right? You can build the best resource. If nobody knows about it, it's kind of just sitting there. Um, so this is outreach to members. Another part of it is a grant program um, that has been ongoing for a while that is supposed to, again, combine uh, individuals across departments. And there's finally, there's a graduate certificate program for grad students at the U. Okay, what you can do with all of these tools, if you're in biostatistics, Zhang is gonna talk to you about that. Okay, um, great. Thank you, um, Sebastian, for this very nice and general introduction. Um, so now I'm going to share my slides. All right, so here are the slides here. Um, so as uh, Sebastian have already brought up, the Precision Health is really a large scale cross campus present, uh, presidential initiative supported by three different schools and the Office of Provost. And the main idea is try to create the data resources to serve as accelerator and incubator for interdisciplinary research across the campus. And in generally speaking, there are four components of the data available in the precision health. So there is a structured clinical data, there's a social economic data, there's some image data, and also the genetic data. So the structured clinical data is the EHR data effectively. These are the de-identified clinical data for um, are more than 4 million unique Michigan medicine patients. So the last time I checked, there are actually 4.7 million um, data points over there. And this includes longitudinal data pertaining to all laboratory results, medication, procedures, outcomes, vital signs, uh, and many more. So that's a huge database uh, over there with the EHR data. And then for each of those Michigan medicine patients, we also have their detailed address and we are able to map the address to the US Census block group and the tracks uh, so that in turn, you can extract those neighborhood-based social economic data components without releasing, without revealing the uh, uh, detailed um, uh, address. So that's the second part of the social economic data. So both the structured uh, clinical data and the social economic data are measured on more than 4 million Michigan patients. So it's huge. On the other hand, the image data and the genetic data are relatively small compared to these two, but it's still huge on themselves. And those are collected on a subset of the um, Michigan medicine patients data. So in particular for the image data, that's the chest X-ray repository includes the X-ray performed on Michigan medicine patients from 2019 to September, 2021. And there are right now in total of 750 images for about 100,000 Michigan medicine patients and with many more to come. 
And for the genetic data, as Sebastian briefly mentioned, uh, we uh, have the, uh, the last, the current genetic data phase, which is phase four, includes face and imputed genetic data for more than 60,000 the MGI participants. And so um, both the image data and the genetic data are essentially are measured on the subset of uh, Michigan medicine patients, but they are very contains very uh, rich uh, information uh, for your um, analysis tasks. So um, I'm going to talk about some example data usage on um, those data sets. And uh, I'll first focus on the MGI component um, because the MGI is uh, my research area and many of uh, us are more familiar with this part. Um, but keep in mind that the um, precision health is a huge data source. It's much, much beyond this uh, genetic data available in Michigan Genomic Initiative. And in addition, this data is still ongoing efforts. So there are still more patients in loads and more data collecting every day, every month. Well, the Michigan um, Genomics Initiative contains basically two types of data. One is the genetic data. The other is the medical uh, phenotypes or the EHR data, and you compare them together. So right now, um, as of a couple of months ago, there are 84,000 consented individuals already, and uh, upon which, as the last slide showed, we have collected genotype information for 60,000 individuals. And those include 50, uh, approximately 50 million uh, SNPs genotype uh, information per, per sample. And uh, in addition to the genotype data, we have also uh, have four EHR records on those individuals. This include uh, over 22 million medical encounters with uh, Michigan medicine. So it's um, huge EHR plus the genotype data. More importantly, it's about ongoing efforts. So not only the sample sizes keep increasing, but there are more and more phenotypes getting collected and measured on this individual. So for example, the MyPAC study that using Apple Watch to um, trace the behavioral and the lifestyle phenotypes for the patients. And the IPQ survey can um, obtain the family history and social and environmental features on the patients. So this is a very rich data resource. And it's actually very easy to obtain, to have access to this data. So in particular, you only need to go through the IRB um, process and you can have a count on this um, um, uh, the, the data direct website, you just need to put it log in directly over there and you can have access to health records and also the genetic data. And in fact, uh, with the data direct, you have access to more, much of the, the whole precision health data resource over there. And uh, uh, our team on the, uh, on the genetic side, um, including um, Brad, um, Anita, and also Matt and Lance and uh, uh, Snehal recently, uh, rejoin us. And so we are providing uh, uh, a lot of uh, data, um, data help, analytics helps, and also services to help you to get access to the data and to help you to perform analysis in the uh, MGI datasets. So in particular, we're happy to uh, work with you on a wider range of scientific questions and study designs. And no matter what type of clinical expertise, data accessibility you have, we will be able to help you to access the data to run the targeted analysis that you want to um, do. And in fact, you don't even need to know anything about the genetics. So there are people in our team that can help you consulting those, uh, uh, those basic uh, 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 analytical um, plans. And uh, in addition, we also provide those websites which facilitates you to directly run those genotype and genetic analysis. So in particular, there are two uh, web resources uh, available over there for the uh, MIG, uh, MGI data set. And so this includes the free web on the left and the on-call on the right-hand side. So the free web, what it does is essentially, um, it's a website interface where it allows you to visualize the genome-wide association study results for um, 1,700 phenotypes. So those are the 1,700 EHI phenotypes measurements you have, and it provides you all the GWAS, the, the SNP and the phenotype association results on the website. And so it makes it really very easy to visualize. So for example, you can just input the uh, trait name you are interested in. It will show this type of Manhattan type plots. And so the dots over there represents a SNP and the, uh, 
uh, and then uh, if you click a particular snippet, it will actually choose the GWAS association results for all the traits. So for example, over here, you can see that for this particular SNP, it has association with uh, a bunch of type one diabetes phenotypes and a bunch of type two diabetes phenotypes. So through this visualization, it facilitates um, your research. And in addition, if you're interested in uh, performing additional analysis on phenotypes beyond the 17, Southern traits, you can use the Uncle website over there. You all, all you need to do is just to click the phenotype you are interested in to perform a GWAS study and uh, click what genotype format you want, uh, genotype version you want to use, and then incorporate all the covariates you want to put in, and then click run. So that's all you need to do. It automatically carries out all the genome-wide association studies directly for you. So you don't really need to um, run the law and, and the analytic software set. And uh, in addition to that, there's, uh, as best you mentioned, there's a- Do you want to minimize the other parts for, for that? Oh, yeah, sure. Do, do you know how, how should I? Okay, okay, okay. yeah. Um, so uh, as Sebastian also mentioned, there's a huge data resource, there's a huge computational facility uh, behind that that um, provides free to use. And so in particular, you can use the uh, AMIS-2, which is a Linux system to directly have access to the raw data and perform analysis on the cluster. Um, it's all for free. And also Unibyte, which is a Windows type of uh, environment. And uh, uh, this is a, contains, uh, this is a secure computation environment. So it's uh, everything is uh, secure and uh, HIPAA compliant uh, environment over there. And so with the genetic EHR data, as you mentioned, there are all kinds of analysis. Now you can start to carry out all those integrative analysis. So for example, for the, for the beginning, right, you can perform genome-wide association studies. You can use the website I just mentioned to carry out that. So for each SNP uh, at a time, for, for example, if you are interested in this and diabetes phenotype, you can just click the website or just go to the field web, look at the results over there. So it will show you um, all the SNP association and you can identify in which genetic region or which genetic region that is um, associated with diabetes. And you can run this for all kinds of phenotypes. Recall that in the EHR, we have really a large number of phenotypes over there. And so once you run all this, you can um, also simply click one SNP and it will reveal all the association phenotype associated with results for this one particular SNP. So you can see that performing those integrative analysis, it opens many doors for many research potentials. So I show you a, a few concrete research examples. And so the first one is um, based on Matt's um, research collaboration with Caroline. So her research is focused on improving health outcomes in gynecology and particular prevention and treatment of pelvic organ prolapse. And so she was interested in what's the genetic basis of female pelvic organ prolapse, right? And there are not much literature, there haven't been much studies performed. And so if she wants to do that, right, in figure out the genetic basis on that, she will actually need to perform a genome-wide association study. And performing a genome-wide association study is extremely expensive, and extremely time-consuming because you need to recruit cases of controls, you need to extract their blood samples, extract their DNA, running um, uh, TRIPS uh, 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 analysis, genotype processing, imputation, requires a lot of computation resources. So basically, requires a lot of time, requires a lot of investment, and potentially you, you need at least one hour one to carry out this type of GWAS studies. So instead, uh, carrying out of her own GWAS studies, you could simply look into the MGI. Right, because we have so many EHR phenotypes over there, we have so many already pre-processed genotype information over there. So you can uh, obtain the individuals um, with the with the uh, ICD nine and ten code for prolapse. So those are your phenotype information, and uh, you, you can also uh, extract uh, another group of uh, individuals uh, without the ICD nine and uh, um, CD ten code, and uh, and it's also um, as uh, to serve as a control. So therefore, now you can easily, based on the MJ data set, you can extract cases, extract the controls, and directly perform a GWAS study. And this is very simple. And it's uh, really just go to on the, say, the Uncle website, click the phenotype name, click run a couple of days later, or maybe just hours later, you will receive the report, and you got to publish paper. So it's extremely fast process to take advantage of data resource variable here. So as another, 
um, data example. So uh, my collaborator, Sensei, she is interested in a disease called spontaneous coronary artery dissection or SCAD. So SCAD is a devastating disease and it only, it happens primarily in young women. Actually 90% of cases are happening in young women. And this is an underdiagnosis of disease. And so not many is known. So we were, and so she is interested in understanding the, um, the basis of the SCAD and what are the risk factors associated with SCAD, which is not easy to do. So what she did was to, she collected this SCAD um, GWAS data set a few thousand individuals and because of the strong genetic components, she would actually identify a multiple genetic loads are associated with SCAD. However, unfortunately, the data she collected does not have many risk factors. So we look at the tutelage MGI, which uh, as you remember, it contains the EHR data. So you have the full scale uh, constructed clinical information. So therefore, we propose that to combine the SCAD GWAS which is separated and cohort from the MGI and linked to the MGI cohort directly, taking advantage of the risk factors, the comprehensive EHR records and the genotype information available in the um, MGI data. And so therefore, we basically propose those instrumental variable analysis where you can use the SNP information as instruments. And because the SNPs are shared between the MGI data and also between the SCADA data, and so therefore the shared component allows you to perform integrative analysis, try to identify what are the risk factors underlying scale. And certainly doing this would also motivate our development of statistical methods because there's not many effective two sample instrument variable analysis methods over there. So it motivates us to develop more sophisticated statistical models that can allow us to do this type of uh, integrative analysis allow us to obtain the calibrated p-value so that we can have sufficient power to identify risk factors on the light scale. So um, as a third example, um, again, on the uh, scale over there, um, so she was very interested in using the genotype information to predict the scale. So as you uh, can think of, this is basically try to predict a construct of polygenic risk score and in the easiest case, maybe you could use say a lasso model um, to do that, to do that uh, um, prediction models. Now, the tricky part is again, is that the SCAD is relatively small and GWAS study only consists of a few thousand individuals, while the MGI is much, much larger. So we decided to take advantage of the MGI much larger data set in order to construct a better prediction model for SCAD. So in particular, we can identify the risk factors in the MGI and construct the risk of prediction models uh, for the related trading MGI. And because these are two data sets, they don't really share the genotype, they don't really share the individual. However, they share those co-effect size, the betas. So those are the SNP effect size uh, on the phenotype or the covariate effects on the phenotype. And because those are the, uh, the traits in the MGI could have potentially genetically related to SCAD, so we can hypothesize that the beta one and beta two could be potentially correlated with each other. And we can explicitly model that correlation structure so that we can take advantage of this huge GOS data in the MGI to facilitate the prediction uh, of SCAD uh, in a separate um, cohort study. So now you can see that all those studies, we really um, uh, try to take advantage of this rich um, data in the precision chaos in the MGI and to motivate both the scientific study and potentially help us to develop better methods so that we can uh, facilitate further um, scientific discoveries. And uh, certainly all the three examples I mentioned was focused on the MGI, but keep in mind that the precision chaos is much, much larger than MGI. So you actually have uh, for over 4 million patients uh, records over there. And uh, so indeed, uh, in the for, um, several uh, cases of uh, teachings and um, several instructors, uh, several professors said that you, uh, uh, in the biostats and department that have been utilizing the precision health resources uh, for teaching. And then many of them have been using this very large, um, the, the EHR data for teaching. So for example, um, Jim Morrison, she taught this biostat 699 um, just early um, in, the, in the winter semester this year. So on this, uh, 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 in the class, so she um, uh, she has this project uh, for the student to work on the project to predict hospitalization in a particular time period based on information in their medical records from two years prior, primarily using the ICD codes. So therefore, 
her work is really for, her project teaching project is really focused on utilizing this whole structured um, EHR data. And so in the class, the students went through the standard uh, HIPAA training and PSN training. Those, um, this are relatively easy training to go through. And after the training, after they got a certification, now they can extract the data from the database with SQL and save them as files on the, uh, on the uh, work, uh, work environment. And then the students can log in using a, either a virtual desktop interface or just log in to the AMS2 server Linux environment. And so they can direct the access to all those data information on the cluster and running their software, running their prediction models uh, on the cluster and uh, eventually report the, uh, the results um, to the, uh, as a, a project uh, uh, for the project. And so as Jim mentioned uh, to me, so the biggest benefits is she found that it was, um, some students thought the data was really interesting. I had a very good time in doing the project. And in fact, several of the students later was able to write in their job description that they had experience with handling, analyzing the CHR data. As another teaching example, Walter and Nick called about that 625. And they use the precision health data from a different study called the uh, MyPAC study with about 7,000 participation um, individuals. And the main data sets actually have this um, Apple Watch data uh, with recorded various measurements of uh, activities over time. So it's a very complicated, very interesting data structure. And in addition to those Apple Watch data, they have the additional EHR data as all the individuals in the precision health have and the survey data for the same participants in the study. And uh, uh, they were uh, working on uh, projects uh, on this my particular study and they found that a very uh, interesting problem as to how to handle the amount of missingness data and how to address the missing data in this uh, approach. And in fact, through the teaching, several students actually come up with new ideas on how to handle this uh, type of missingness and this could be potentially turned into even like uh, research projects in the future. And uh, as the last example uh, for teaching, the Matt, um, he taught Big Data Summit Institute this summer. And uh, this year, everything is online. So he taught this whole class uh, online. And he used the EHA data for 850,000 patients for as a class project. And so those include demographics, BMI, commodities, hospitalization measurements. And the project is try to uh, uh, examine the benefits of aiding clinical lab results as a risk of predictors of uh, hospitalization. And so he uh, and his students use the variable selection, penalized regression, try to explore the benefits of aiding clinical labs. So you can see there are all kinds of different topics that you can use for, for the teaching. And uh, this is clearly not restricted to MGN, it's clearly or, uh, widely available to all kinds of data in the precision health. And finally, um, the Precision Health um, also provides a rich resource for um, grants. So in particular, there are internal grant support. There's a uh, um, scholar um, awards uh, every year to generate, in, uh, to, to award it to graduate students or fellows, residents and trainees to generate interest in Precision Health. While there's also investigator um, awards to uh, um, encourage uh, forming new collaborative research projects uh, uh, in precision health in you know, order to advance science and develop health uh, innovations. And in addition to that, the precision health also provides you a rich resource for external grant support. So for example, this data is huge. You have a huge number of individuals, huge number of rich data, uh, rich sources of data. So it makes it very easy to generate preliminary data for the grants uh, you are writing. And uh, the data in the precision health, they could serve as very useful data resources for methodology grant, or can help provide you analysis of validation data resources for analysis type of grants. And you can also easily get supporting letters from the, all the co-directors, including Sebastian. And uh, uh, we are also working on developing a resource to uh, support grant writing as well. So, um, so that's all uh, I um, have on the slides. And so this is the acknowledgement page. It's, uh, it's really due to the support of all the um, staff and the directors and the faculty uh, directors. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's the question. Well, yeah. If you have a question, you want to write down or something. Okay, um, I'll stop sharing. Yeah, that. Stop sharing. Yeah. And I think, Anissa, 
And I think that would be your turn now to um, give us the details. Perfect. Give me one second here to open this up. Can you guys see my screen? Uh, yeah. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you, Sebastian, for inviting uh, Precision Health to, you know, present our resources and um, show everyone what we have available and what you can use for your research, as well as for your classes. So today for my presentation, I'm going to do an overview of what Precision Health is, um, what data sets are available, some self-serve tools, and our HIPAA compliant resources, our process to gain access to the analytics platform, as well as the documentation that's available. A lot of this information will be <laughs> duplicate of what Zhang uh, presented, but hopefully in a different way and um, how it all ties into all of our resources as a whole. I did want to make, um, although some of us are online, I did want to make this as interactive as possible. So um, if you can go ahead and tell me before this presentation, how familiar were you with Precision Health and its resources? Um, and there is a link or you can text your response. And we'll give everyone a couple more minutes here. Not at all. Well, hopefully we're able to assist with that and you'll know a lot more about Precision Health after today. Okay, that's great to see. For us, we need to let our audience in the Zoom to know how to participate. Can you see that? I just dropped the link in the, uh, the chat. I just opened that chat. Well, and it seems like a lot have heard of it, but never used our resources. So I'm hoping to get more um, consultations and one-on-one -on -one time with all of you to get you to use what we have available. So when doing these presentations, I always like to start with the history lesson of where we started and where we are now. At Conception, Precision Health had a great backbone of data to make available to its researchers. It all started with the Michigan Genomics Initiative or what we call MGI. MGI is a research biorepository. Initial recruitment began in 2012 and patients signed a very broad consent. So they gave a sample donation. We have baseline and longitudinal surveys for our participants. We have access to all of their health records. We can share this data with anyone. And we also have the ability to recontact these uh, participants if there was additional information that we needed from them. There are over 10 MGI partner studies that contribute to MGI. Um, what we were trying to do is diversify our MGI population population demographically as well as clinically. And you know, MGI's recruitment started in a pre-op setting. A lot of our patients were older, sicker patients. And once we started incorporating partner studies, um, we saw a more diverse um, cohort. So for example, we added men and they recruit from the metabolism, endocrinology and diabetes clinics. Um, we have MHB2 and prompt, their mental health biobanks, each collecting different variables as well as wearables data. Uh, MyPact, also known as the Apple Watch study, they focus on collecting measurements from the Apple Watch as well as blood pressures. Big Bird is a pediatric collection effort. So you would think that these are pediatric patients. However, these are um, patients that have pediatric disease. Um, and then my part has been focusing on increasing diversity. And since COVID has switched all of their consenting efforts to um, virtual. So this was a big, uh, exciting feat on our end to be able to do this. So putting all these studies together, um, we're able to access all their research data that is being collected. And that's what makes this all of our data that we have so robust, um, all, all of our research data. But we don't only have data on the 80,000 MGI participants. Um, what makes Precision Health unique is being able to add breadth and depth to the patient data for all 4 million Michigan medicine patients um, and being able to link all the different data sets together. So we have structured clinical data, we have socioeconomic data, imaging data, 
genetic data as well as survey data on these patients. We'll soon also be adding wearables data that we're very excited about. With a structured clinical data, like Xiang mentioned, we have de-identified clinical, structured clinical data on more than 4 million unique Michigan medicine patients. Um, for this data, we, it goes back to 2002, and we have anthropometric data, which contains patient height, weight, body mass index, um, any comorbidities, and these are measured on an Elix Hauser or Charlson methods demographic information, diagnosis, any encounter information for these patients, lab results, meds. Um, for our specific MGI participants, we have genetic ancestry, as well as then social economic data, different orders and procedures that were ordered on all of our 4 million Michigan medicine patients. We also have our socioeconomic data. And what we did here was we geocoded all patients' current and previous addresses, so historical addresses. And we mapped it to the US Census and American um, Community Survey. What we did was then we're able to link it to the National Neighborhood Data Archive, also known as NANDA. And now we have all these different indices on all of our Michigan medicine patients. So we're able to see their neighborhood disadvantage index, neighborhood affluence, um, immigrant ethnicity index, as well as their education level. So these four items have been completely de-identified and able to use. The other items that you see here, we also have available, but you need um, special permissions or additional IRB approvals in order to see this protected health information. Um, and we have information about how many parks are in the neighborhood or land cover, or any public transit stops around their neighborhood. For the socioeconomic data, one thing to remember is that it's not for that specific patient, but it's for that neighborhood or that block that they live in. An example research question that one can answer um, with this data is, does, is socioeconomic status correlated with the length or frequency of hospitalization? So um, we have one researcher that's looking at how many trees or bushes are around that patient's neighborhood um, to be able to see how often they're in the hospital or how long they're in the hospital for. We also have the Michigan, um, the imaging data. So these are chest x-rays on Michigan medicine patients like Shang mentioned. Right now we have these chest x-rays from 2019 to September, 2020. We have about 750,000 images for more than 100 Michigan, 100,000 Michigan medicine patients. Again, these are um, accessible through Yodabyte or Armis. They're in our precision health turbo environment. They can be viewable through microdicom, or you can also plot them on Jupyter Notebook. Um, we made sure that you're able to link all, this all of these images to their clinical data and health data that we also have available. So we created a patient population for them. So you can just pick that patient population and you're able to pull all of that clinical data and match it with the imaging data. And we're very excited about this. We're also working on bringing brain MRIs into our data sets. Um, and these are focused on stroke patients. So we'll let you know when those are available, but right now these are in the starting stages, but wanted to let everyone know that these are coming. And then we have the genetic data. I won't go into depth about this since you already heard um, Shang talk about it. Um, again, we have about 60,000 participants, which we have genotype data on, and a subset of participants that we have whole exome and targeted sequencing on. And one question that can be answered with that is, could a routine clinical pharmacogenomic test reduce the rates of adverse drug effects? For our survey data, so a lot of researchers have utilized our MGI participants for recontact. Um, the MGI pain questionnaires leveraged the PROMISE measures and included domains of patient reported outcomes 
including pain severity, physical function, depression, anxiety, as well as life stress scales. Um, the longitudinal effort that goes along with these pain questionnaires is more measuring how much uh, participants have continued to use their opioids after a certain period after their surgeries. For the epidemiological questionnaire, also known as EPIQ, MGI participants were invited to participate in 25 surveys ranging from personal health, family, diet, cancer screening and history, and much, much more. Um, and this really gives you a really good picture about all of our patients and their personal health that you're not able to find in their patient's chart or what they're telling their physicians, but these are very personal to them and their lifestyles. The COVID-19 survey was then administered to subjects enrolled in the University uh, of Michigan Central Biorepository. Most were MGI participants, and we were collecting um, data on COVID exposures, testing, diagnosis, as well as symptoms and demographic characteristics. So one thing that's interesting for, with this is, or something that you can do with this uh, COVID-19 survey data is, you can see, for example, um, their exposures inside the house and outside the house. And then you can also match it to you know, their home, how many rooms were in the home, how were exposures, how they were, they were, how they were exposed to COVID within inside their household. So it's very interesting information that we were able to gather. Again, all of this information can be linked back to their clinical records as well. So when the pandemic started last year and labs shut down, researchers started utilizing the clinical data that we already had access to in the patient's charts. Uh, Precision Health gathered a slew of resources specific to COVID-19 patients. And some of our resources are being able to put together a starting population of COVID patients. So these were a subset of Michigan medicine patients who had tested positive for COVID. Um, some of them had their samples in the central biorepository if you're interested in specimen. And then the survey data that, are, that I already uh, spoke about. And then we also have a vaccination starting population. So um, Michigan medicine patients who have received a COVID-19 vaccine. And then we also have a SARS-CoV-2 sequence cohort. So these are Michigan medicine patients who tested positive for COVID-19 and also had their virus RNA sequence. So we have all of this available um, as part of our COVID-19 resources. An example of research questions that one can ask with all of these are, what is the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on health emergency services? Or um, have readmission rates and ED utilization changed during COVID-19 pandemic? So with the shift in research from lab bench to structured clinical data, we made sure to put together a list of pre-baked definitions of patient populations. Now these populations have been validated by our quality analytics at Michigan Medicine, um, the data office, the central biorepository, as well as experts in the field. Um, when looking at all of these patient populations, we wanted to create definitions that not everyone is experts on, but they can do some research with it. So for example, we have a diabetes registry, um, cohort of heart failure patients, um, Michigan medicine primary care patients. So a lot of our Michigan, since Michigan medicine is a tertiary center, um, a lot of our patients do not get their primary health at um, U of M. So in order for some research studies to do their evaluation on long-term patient care, they want to know how many Michigan medicine patients have their primary care here, and that way we can do a long-term follow-up on them. We also have surgical patients. So these are patients that have received anesthesia care here at U of M, along with our COVID-19 resources, um, our chest x-rays. So again, this is how you're easily able to link the chest x-rays that we have available with the clinical data, and then patients that are part of the biorepository as well, along with our Michigan uh, Genomics Initiative study participants. 
Now that we know what kind of data is available, how do we get to it? Um, so we have a few self-serve tools to our clinical. One is genetic, and our first one is Precision Health Data Direct. This is a web interface. Precision Health uh, de-identified RDW, which gives you direct database access to the clinical data. And then we also have Encore, which enables researchers to run their own genome-wide association study. Um, and to go into depth a little bit about that, First, I want to poll everyone and ask, have you ever used Data Direct for your research before? No. <laughs> okay. So more leaning towards the no. Um, and hopefully we'll get you leaning towards the yes next time. So for our self-serve tool, Precision Health Data Direct, um, there's two different modes. So there's a cohort discovery mode, and this is where you can go in, put in your research criteria of inclusion and exclusion to build your patient cohort. And you can get quick aggregate counts of how many um, patients are within a certain age range or different race, ethnicity, as well as um, gender. And then we also have download mode where you can get patient level data for download to our secure research enclave. And here we have all of our data that's downloaded from Precision Health Data Direct is in our Precision Health Turbo Storage. And you can analyze it through our Yodabyte or Armis 2. Uh, Windows or a Linux environment. And through Armis 2, we also have the 48 GPUs that are available, um, which Precision Health has purchased for you. Our next self-serve tool is Precision Health de-identified RDW. Um, so for this, this gives you direct database access. Um, you can analyze large scale data sets. So where in the self-serve tool, the web-based one, Data Direct, um, you're building everything on the interface where here you can actually write your own code and your queries. And for those that are comfortable with SQL, um, it's much easier to use. Uh, for downloading these large scale data sets. Um, they are accessible. So the SQL server, this Pre Precision Health de-identified RDW is accessible through our Yodabyte virtual machine. But now we also have it, have it available where you can um, query it through RStudio and Python. So this is where you would be able to save your cohort and go back to it and pull additional data. Uh, it's much easier to query. And then our next self-serve tool is Encore, um, not to be confused with Encore for clinical research. This Encore for genetic research is still in beta mode, but it, in the future will be available to use for GWAS. So through Encore, researchers can upload a phenotype file that you acquire from our uh, clinical data self-serve tools. Then you can create and build your GWAS model, wait for your job to run, and you can download summary stats as well as view interactive plots such as Manhattan QQ and Locus Zoom plots. So to give you a little bit of background on our compute environment, um, we want to make sure that all this data stays in this environment. And we wanted to to give this resource to the researchers that didn't have access to a HIPAA compliant compute environment. And I know we've said that all this data is de-identified or coded, um, but the more data sets you put together, the more identifiable this data becomes when you're putting clinical data, genetic data, socioeconomic data, any survey data that we might be getting from these participants. We wanna make sure that we keep their identity as well as the data that they have kind of donated and gifted us. Um, secure and protected. So through our environment, you do have available GPUs and CPUs that are available. We have about 288 CPUs and 48 GPUs that Precision Health has funded. Um, we also, if you're if you'll be using your Armis 2 accounts, make sure that it's associated with Precision Health in order to utilize the GPUs. So out of all the resources that I've mentioned, which resource could you benefit from most? Okay. 
So ARM has two GPUs, the clinical data through data direct, genetic data, socioeconomic status data, the surveys, and now we're getting everything. That's great. I love seeing everyone's interest. Okay, this is great. So all of the resources we've made available are great for classroom use and research use. Um, we have a pretty quick turnaround for access, provided you fulfill all these prerequisites. So some of them, you all have level one passwords, so that's easy to do. Enrollment in Duo, completion of a HIPAA tra training through my link. So this is specific to our self serve tools, just saying that you'll protect this data, you'll keep it in our environment. Um, and then active certification of peers. So this is a human subjects research protection through my link, assigned data attestation. This is similar to what you're also learning in that HIPAA training, again, keeping all this data safe and in our environment. Um, an e-research, in order to obtain patient level data, we also need an e-research application through IRB Med. And at a minimum, obtain a non-regulated determination. This is a very quick IRB application. Usually you'll receive approvals within 24 hours. Um, if you need help putting this together, we do have some, um, some resources for you. I can also walk you through how to put together the application. Um, and we do have some examples that I can share as well. And then finally, Precision Health membership for faculty and students in order to use our resources. We wanna make sure that you're part of our Precision Health membership. And a lot, there's a lot of benefits to becoming a Precision Health member. Um, one of them is uh, by collaborating with other researchers that are members with Precision Health. Um, advancing your work through access to data sets. So being a Precision Health member, you have now have access to all the data sets and resources that I had mentioned. Um, funding opportunities. So we have investigator awards. Before COVID, we also had scholar awards available. So hopefully that'll also come back. But for now, investigator awards. And then also make your research visible through our website. So once you're a member, we can do promotions about your publications or give you member spotlights. Um, you can serve on our work groups or review grants, as well as any mentorship opportunities for postgrad residents, fellows, and trainees. Now, before you start working with all this data, it's important to remember the main reason we have this data in the first place. And so when this data was collected, it was inputted by clinicians into the patient's chart. And then it's used by hospital administrators for billing. And then there's also the malpractice lawyers that are using this data for, to sue people. Um, but we as data scientists have become have come in as info magicians wanting to use this data as for research. Clinical data is very messy to work with. There's plenty of holes in the data, which is what also makes it great data sets to test methods and algorithms after you use synthetic data, for example. But given all the obstacles, we wanted to make sure it's easier to use and understand. So we created a documentation website specific to the data that we've made available. So in the documentation website, we have user guides to all of our resources. We have data dictionaries. So any data that you see in our self-serve tools, you'll see defined in our data dictionaries. And then we also have a clinical glossary for those that aren't used to working with the clinical data. Um, a lot of our terms are defined in the clinical glossary. If there's anything not defined, please let us know and we'll go ahead and add it. And then for our surveys, we have all of our survey instruments uh, and the branching logic that goes along with those as well. Now we've also created a GitLab um, website for our documentation. So this is to promote community building. We also have a code library and best practices here as well. If you would like access to this Precision Health documentation GitLab site, please let us know and we'll go ahead and um, add you to our user group. So I've added, I've shown you all the resources that we have available, but what additional resources or data would you like offered um, that we don't already have?
And I know I caught everyone off guard with this question. I know we've heard claims data is of interest. Um, so we're working on, hopefully we're using different research projects to make that data available. Survey data. What other so survey you data? A question? Is it, yeah, is it yep, of course. A so, so this is Arvind, I just want to thank you again for making this resource available. Uh, it's been fantastic for us in a lot of ways. So thank you for that. I had a question in terms of are there, um, is there a version of data available that can be used for classroom instruction? Um, yes. Is, yeah, go ahead. Yes, Arvind. And if you're interested in this, I can also um, set up a one-on-one -on -one with you after, and we can go through how you can use the data for your classrooms. But yes, so um, Jean Morrison has used it for her class. Um, uh, Matt Zawistowski used it for, for the Big Data Institute program. So all of this data, what we wanted to do was create it so it can be used in classrooms. And we did identify it or code it so it can be used. And of course, um, wanting to keep it in the secure environment that we have created as well. So we do have a process on how you can use this data for your classrooms. Uh, there are stipulations on GPA, GPU usage, um, so let's let's talk, Arvind, and I took a note here um, so we can connect after. Wonderful, thank you. And I know people are texting you, so I don't want to take my spot before that, but I also wanted to ask for um, pathology data. I think there's a lot of wonderful, just like you're putting out MRI scans, I think that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. There's also a, a growing body of uh, folks here that are interested in analyzing pathology data like myself. So histology, h &D images that people typically obtain, if that can be made available somehow, that would be fantastic. Yeah, so that's definitely something that we've been hearing more frequently about lately. And I'll have to, we'll have to have discussions about that internally, but that's definitely something that has come up more recently. Thank you, Arvind. Thank you. Um, CGM data, can someone, um, and maybe we'll go through these internally as well to figure out exactly what they are. Unstructured data. So we do, we have started um, a project to de-identify our unstructured data. We are actually starting with, thank you so much for all of your ideas. These are great. Um, we have started using NLP on our chest x-ray annotations that we have. And we started with the chest x-rays because we have this you know, repository of chest x-rays available. So we wanted to see how to de-identify that, those unstructured data. So there is um, efforts going into that unstructured data um, being de-identified. Polygenic rate, the risk scores, oops. This is great. Single cell data, okay. What is the timeline for DID on structured data? Um, this depends on how our models, <laughs> this all depends on how our models um, work with the clinical data that we have available. Um, we've begun work on it. We're trying to push it along as fast as possible. I want to say for the chest x-rays a few months, but um, don't quote me on it yet. Uh, spatial transcriptomics. All of the genetic data, I will leave up to Sebastian to answer any um, questions or push further. Prescription data. So for the prescription data, this is very tricky. Um, we have made efforts into collecting this data. We have uh, what is being ordered but we don't know if that prescription was being fulfilled. And what we did was we made an agreement with SureScript, which gives us prescription fulfillment data, and we have it for our MGI population. However, it does not include um, pharmacies like Kroger or Costco. So two big pharmacies, we do not have uh, prescription fulfillment data on, um, but that's a big one, a big gap in our data. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to, to let you all know, we do have how-to screencasts of 
um, some of our resources that we have available, but also how to put in a ticket, um, how, you know, how to log into our environments, and then any research scientific facilitation that I can do with you, one-on-one -on -one consultations, please email me at phdatahelp at umich.edu, and I'm more than happy to set up time, uh, go through your research question, and see which resources can best be used for your research and for your classrooms. And then I think we'll go through, I'll end my slideshow, and we'll go through um, our Q&A. And I'll pass it along to Sebastian. Excellent. Um, yeah. Um, so I guess we are going to start touching on a couple of questions that were put into the original. Um, I'm not on camera. OK. Let me walk over here. OK. Even better. Um, um, so one of the one of a lot of the basic questions that came, um, and I, I hope that most of the things you said you didn't know um, were already answered in the presentation. So a lot of the original questions were about um, what kind of data is this, right? How well is it cleaned? Where can I get help cleaning it, right? Cleaning this is this is raw data. Cleaning it is on you. For a research project, if that's what you want to do, right, you'll get messy data because data is messy, right? So that will be as part of your research project. This is not, nobody is, let's say outside of the genetic data, nobody is sitting there and sort of making this data as pretty as you can in big parts because at how you clean it already will affect the outcome, can affect the outcome of your research question, right? For a lot of the questions you might be working on, there is no predefined best way of cleaning it, right? And, the choices matter that you make there, right? So data cleaning will broadly be on you. Um, let me see what else did we have. Uh, so as before, um, access to all of these resources that we discussed today is free. Once you have your HIPAA uh, compliant, once you have your, not HIPAA, once you have done all the HIPAA training and once you have your IRB, um, permission to do the study you want to do, you get the access to the data and um, you don't have to pay for any of it. If you want to, and Anissa has not talked about that, if you want to somebody create a data set for you, where you just say, I have these and these things I'm interested in, but my SQL skills aren't strong enough and the data direct, the, the drop-down menus on data direct are too imprecise, then uh, people in the data office will create that data set for you but you will be paying for the hours it takes them to create that data set. That's the only point anywhere in all of this where it will cost you money to, um, to get access to this data. Um, other questions that came up. Um, oh yeah, one, to, to all of the genomics data that genomics, broad sense genomics data that was asked for earlier. So we do not have the budget unsurprisingly to create proteomics or metabolomics data on 80,000 people, um, because that's a lot of money. However, uh, broadly the rule exists that whenever you use MGI data to, um, to perform any laboratory experiment, the results of your laboratory experiment go back to us. So you might've seen earlier, we have about 500, 500 individuals for whom we have exome sequencing. That's not because we paid for exome sequencing, but somebody decided, I want to exome sequence those people. We said, fine, here have the DNA, give us the sequence when you're done. So now there's 500 individuals for whom we have exome sequencing if you want to experiment with exome sequencing. The same may be true for many other uses of this data, right? But really, experimentally, we will not be able to generate anything what you don't just get from genotyping data. Um, at least where we are right now. This may of course change as technology changes over time, but where we are right now, that's what it is. Um, okay, one question uh, was about the linkage of family members. And there I honestly, outside, I know for the genetic data, we can of course identify who's related to whom, because if you have genetic data, that's not hard. I don't know whether it's possible 
other ways to identify family members entered in the data set. And Anissa will know that better than me. So we can identify, we have just made available mother-child relations in our self-serve tools. This is through our um, stork data, what we call it. So you can link them that way. Um, other than that, we do not um, have abilities to link family members together. If you have mother, mother offspring, as you should be able to identify. That's it, yep. Those okay. are the only identifiers or linkages that we have available. Um, another question was whether this is both hospital and clinic records. My understanding is anything that happens in Michigan medicine is in that data set, right? Whether you go to the hospital or to any other Michigan medicine clinic, that doesn't matter. That's correct. Um, and then finally, can the data, can you link the data to state registries? Um, again, all of Precision Health has been linked to the Michigan Death Registry, um, but otherwise it has not happened yet. Um, it is something we can potentially discuss. Um, I think an important part of what we've said, but what I wish I would have emphasized more in my introduction, this is a living resource. And all of us here are working to make this resource as good as possible. Which means if you come to us with saying, oh, here's this myth Michigan a registry of say cancer, can we link it to that as well? We'll certainly look into it, right? And if it's doable and not too much work, we'll do it. Right? So this is this is supposed to be good for you for your research. So for that we need to for that the more you tell us what you need, the better off we are, and the better off you are, hopefully. Okay, this was all the questions that we got beforehand. Um, do we have questions in the chat, Lou? Uh, no, we only have a comment from Cynthia about our property data. Okay. So she mentioned that uh, you guys have already started to go with the identification of radiology reports, but plan to expand that to discharge summaries and eventually the physician and nursing notes yeah. as well. So the tricky part there is um, it's relatively easy in structured data to remove uh, personal health information because like you just define it. these fields are personal health information and you X them out and you're done. But if you write text, it's very easy that a name slips in there or something else slips in there, right? We have to remove that before we share it and for that, there are methods that do that and those work reasonably well, but we have to test them and make sure that we're sharing data that we can actually, that we're actually supposed to be sharing. Right? So that's why this is not as easy as we would like it to be. Are there any questions? Excellent. Yeah, so um, what's the billing allowance for cancer computing that a student can get if they're part of this initiative? What do you mean by billing allowance? So, I mean, like, if you run jobs on CERN that has a billing hour, in terms of the, the computing cost that job has. So I'm wondering if that's unlimited for students or if we have a limit on the computing hours we are allowed on our institution. So far, we have no limit because we have not run into serious issues outside of the uh, GPUs with it yet. Right. If this takes off like wildfire, so more likely what we would probably do, or what at least my, I mean, actually, Shang will know that, we'll, we'll decide that, not me, but what we're more likely, what I would suggest we do is we just say, here are 30 CPUs for that class. You can brawl it out amongst yourselves, among who gets to use them, right? And then let, let, let the people who take that class figure out how to be, how to treat each other appropriately so that everybody gets their stuff done. Um, but right, right now we're not in a situation where we're running out of where, where our where our machines are heavily overused, so we don't have to worry about that yet. Thank you. So Sebastian, uh, it's uh, it, it obviously that the people on Zoom they cannot hear the question because uh, oh, you can't hear the question. Sorry, but oh, that's okay. Go I ahead. think my my answer was sufficiently good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was okay, but so please, okay. maybe you can repeat yeah, or yeah, we can yeah, use yeah. microphone. I'll just repeat it I think, oh. before we get the microphone set up. Yeah. Yeah, I have a summary just so for the Michigan Medicine and now, uh, is there a common data model that we're following or we just have our own uh, data structure? Well, the question is whether there's a common data model that we're following in the analysis or if 
we define our own data structure. My understanding is you define your own data structure. So there's no, no broad underlying model. You basically get the raw data, right? Uh, sorry, can you actually? Okay, uh, is there a, a consideration of using something like a convolutional model so we can easily um, say, understand the underlying data structure? Not that I know of. Um... Can you repeat that question, Sebastian? So the question is whether there is a plan of using a common data model so that uh, it basically fits easier into existing approaches, is that? Yeah, it, it would be easier say, to combine with other data and, or uh, at least we understand uh, what is each variable, what's the type, what, 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 uh, how, how are they structured? In our documentation website, we do have that for some of our variables that we've made available, um, the underlying structure. But it is like Sebastian said, it, it is pretty raw and you'll have to do a lot of that work on your own. But any information that you need for the underlying data model, just let us know and um, we can put you in contact with our programmers that make all this data available for research. Thank you. And I mean, again, growing resource if this is something that would be of interest or we're also totally happy on piggybacking on your effort if you do that with the data please put it in our github website so other people can uh, can create can use the same tool again right what i didn't mention initially the available of the availability of our own uh, rdw is eight months old so this is not this has not been around for a long time this is only eight months ago we start making this data available. So it's still growing and we're almost certainly still ironing out um, smaller issues that we should have taken care of earlier. I do have another question. So you mentioned about the prescription and you know for the work that I'm doing for dynamic tumor regimes and we do need to have a sequence of treatment. So then in that case, I'm wondering like if you have everything, all the records, from Michigan Madison, they probably should have like, if a patient came back for revisit, and then should we have the past history, like their treatment history? So that is already in there. Okay, got it. So that basically is, like for future prescription, maybe yes. we don't have that. Exactly. So okay. did, did you hear that? Anissa. Yes, I did. Yes. So we have anything that's administered at the hospital. So say, for example, any of their cancer treatments that are administered at the hospital, we have all of those. Any prescriptions or any future revisits to U of M, we also have that. Um, I always say if you're seeing that the order is being placed multiple times, um, you know, throughout time, there it's probably being taken by the, you know, patient. So you can deduce that. Um, but yes, we do have that information on um, all the visits that the patient has come in. Good to know. Not on the Zoom either. So um, I think the people on Zoom, you can unmute yourself if, that, if you have any questions. Um, okay, so there is a question from Man Man asking, how do I access the available data? Can you share the link? Yeah. Yes, so after this presentation, I'm going to send a mass email to everyone that's attended and the ones that have registered with all the links on how to get access to all of our data and available resources as well. So hopefully, Hopefully those links will be easy for you to follow. Um, again, if you need any assistance or have any questions, reach out to me and um, we can set up one-on-one -on -one time to go through the process. Thank you, Anissa. And also for the people who are in person, we have a sign up sheet so that we can have your email address and then we get you connected in the circle, okay? Thank you, Lou.
This is wonderful. Any more questions? I mean, you have the benefit that you have multiple people who are heavily involved with this in the department. So if you're lying awake at tonight and thinking, I should really have asked this question, you can just email any one of us and we'll, if we don't know the answer, figure out who to send the question to and get you the right answer. This is when I have a question. So um, uh, I'm part of the um, Michigan uh, Diabetes uh, Research Center. So we have just um, a compiled a data set um, for, well, we have a diabetes registry, which used to be just cross-sessional. And we actually just compiled a longitudinal uh, diabetes registry for the cohort. And would love to connect to the um, precision medicine data. Um, yeah. It, what is the way to connect to it? I don't know, like... Um... When do you work with Joyce Lee? Yeah, I know Joyce Lee, yeah. Yes, so all of our data is actually already connected to the Michigan Regi to the Diabetes Registry. Oh, really? Um, okay. Yes, so our Precision Health Programmer kind of spearheaded the efforts into linking all this data together. So um, if there is any holes, let me know and I can see what I can do. And maybe if you have any questions, we can set up some time and we can go through where you can find that data. Okay, great, thank you so much. Yeah, of course. So is the data already linked to clinks or not? Is, is the data already linked to clinks? I don't know what clinks is. So I am not familiar with that either. Can um, you spell it and then I can <laughs> I can discuss it with someone and uh, get back to you. I'm, 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 I misunderstood to claims. Claims. Um, so right now it is not linked to claims. We have put in efforts into linking this data with claims. However, um, because of proprietorship with the claims data, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, all the insurance information, um, we have not been able to do that. We have started our efforts with uh, project-based, collecting project-based claims data. However, we have not been able to obtain it for all of our precision health participants or all of our Michigan medicine patients. Um, but for several We're, projects, we have connected it to claims data, right? Yes. Yes, we have started doing that, correct. But if you have a specific project in mind, we can potentially figure out how to do it. It's just not, it's not already there. Exactly. I think some of our faculty, we are working on claims data. We do have the data available to us, but you know, like if that is the case, can we somehow link them together? Maybe not because both are de-identified. Yeah. yeah, so the claims data that is available is through IHPI and maybe Chinsia. Um, she's the one spearheading the efforts with IHPI and um, uh, one of our researchers that is using it for their project right now. But I believe it has been a difficult feat <laughs> to overcome, um, but um, we're working on it is all I can say right now. Um, we'll let you know hopefully soon if it can be made more broadly available. But right now, claims data is av available through IHPI. It is difficult to link to the medical records. Yeah, claims data do have an advantage for us to know the exact treatment sequence. So that is actually very important for us. But there is also a hole in claims data because they don't have like clinical response. Like every time they don't have those. So if we could link them together, that would be wonderful. Thank you. There's one more question here. Is there like a biobank associated with any of these patients in this um, like subject set? And like what sort of uh, samples would be like available for the so for the MG, the question is whether there's a biobank linked to those subjects. For uh, for the MG, I mean for the for the most of the patients, you know, biospecimen, right? For the MGI patients, yes, we have DNA samples for um, for all and for most individuals that have consented for um, to be part of the MGI in the Michigan biobank. Other than like that like serum or like CSF or I think it's serum. 
it's certainly from blood. So I, I don't know where it's like, probably it's probably safe. Yeah. Other questions. Any more questions online? We do not have any other questions on the chat, no. Good. Um, so Anissa, were you going to do a short demo of? Or... I would love to, yeah. I can definitely do a short demo on our self-serve tool and how you can see all this data um, through our web-based interface. And if you have any questions in the meantime, we can all, always come back to it afterwards. Yes, definitely. Okay, so this is our Precision Health um, Data Direct, and we actually have two. So if you hear of Data Direct, there's two different ones. One is um, one contains PHI, protected health information, and that will say Michigan Medicine up top. And this one is de-identified and easier to access, and this says Precision Health on top. Um, so I log in with my level one password. And I'll get a dual authentication here. And again, so this is available to anyone that has fulfilled all of the requirements, all of the prerequisites um, that I outlined previously. So once you come in, you'll get a welcome screen. Um, you can create a new query. So I'll put a name and then all of your Humes, so all of your IRB applications will be populated here. Um, I will select a fake Hume for this training. And then here you see the two different uh, modes. So there's a cohort mode. For cohort mode, you do not need an IRB application. This only gives you aggregate counts. In order to download patient level data, you'll definitely need a Hume number, so an IRB application. And for this training, I'll go ahead and click uh, de-identify download mode and uh, create a new query. So when you look at data direct, there's two different sections um, or three, I should say. So the first is what you start with. So you're starting with um, 4.7 million Michigan medicine patients. One thing that I do want to point out, so our data direct, our precision health data direct is refreshed quarterly. Um, our next refresh is at the end of the month. So um, it should have data all the way until um, September 30th. Um, so here you see 4.7 Michigan medicine patients. And then you look to the left and we have a cohort discovery mode or a cohort discovery tool and then an output view selection. So I always like to start at the top and then work my way down. Um, when you're looking at the populations, these are the pretty big populations that we've made available. Um, if you're interested in only the MGI study participants, we have this available. Um, if you're interested in biospecimen for these MGI participants, you can also select that. And um, you can click add and it'll add it to our cohort. For this, I'm going to pick um, chest x-ray patients. And this includes any patients that have chest x-rays within our repository. So I'm going to add that. And out of that 4.7 million Michigan medicine patients, um, we should get a number close to 100,000 of who we have x-rays on, or chest x-rays on, I should say. And then we go through demographics. So if you're looking at your study, um, you're most likely have inclusion and exclusion criteria for it. Uh, if there is anything that you want to add, if you want to exclude, if you're only interested in patients that are alive, we can add that to our population. So uh, again, out of that 96,000 patients that we have chest x-rays on, how many of them are alive? We'll get a number right here when it refreshes. Um, so 88,000 of those are alive. And then we go through, um, is there a study time frame that you're focusing on? So I'm going to focus on um, 2020 to current and only focusing on eight patients, 18 and up. And I only want inpatients. So how many patients were in the hospital and considered inpatient? 
And you can here also put here visit location. So if you're only interested in patients that were seen at the cardiovascular center, um, you can do that and it'll pull up all of the different clinics at the cardiovascular center to narrow down your patient cohort. Hopefully this doesn't narrow down my patient cohort too much, uh, but I just wanna show you how it all narrows it down to get you exactly what you need based on your cohort definition. Um, here are different comorbidities. So if you're interested in patients with depression, you can click that. Or if you want to include patients, exclude patients that have depression, we can also add that exclusion. Um, so as you can see here, we have 4.7 million patients. 96,000 have chest x-rays, um, 88 are alive, and then 9,000 fit that criteria, our encounter criteria of coming in, had an encounter within that time frame that I was interested in. And then I also want to um, exclude anyone that fit our comorbidities in our uh, Elix-Hauser scale for depression. So I'm going to exclude that. Again, you can go through all of these. If you're interested in certain diagnosis codes, you can pick diabetes, for example, and it'll populate with different diabetes de definitions for you. Um, you can check them, you can add them. Although I only check two, it selects a lot of the mapping on the back end as well. And if you go through this and you say, oh, I only wanted type two diabetes, I didn't want type one, you can go through and exit out type one diabetes. And so now we're only left with type two and then we can add that to our patient population. Again, it's just going to keep dwindling down. And then these are procedures, any procedures that you're interested in, you can either search with CPT codes or ICD codes or keywords, um, whatever procedures you're interested in, and then the procedure date or time frame that you're interested in. Again, you can use inclusion, exclusion criteria here, and you can add it to your cohort. Um, outpatient medications, um, you can add those. Um, if you're interested in patients that are on a tenolol, Tenolol, I'm going to add that. So I only want patients that are on a tenolol. And we're testing the system here, adding all these um, filters. And then there's also medications administered. So um, anything that's been administered at the hospital, you'll see that here. Um, any labs that you're interested in, you can put that in, in here. Any orders that you're interested in, um, for example, a C. diff. Uh, I can't think of an order right now, but if you guys can think of one, just shout it out. Um, so I'm going, you can add those in here as well. Any waveform data we have available, most of them are cardiovascular waveform data. Um, you can include or exclude patients based on that. And then biorepository. So whoever asked about the biorepository patients. So we do have this biorepository filter here. You can research, um, you can pick out a specific study that you're interested to gather samples from. So we have Michigan Genomics Initiative here. Or if you're only interested in samples, say for example, DNA, this will give you DNA samples out of the whole entire biorepository, not only specific to MGI participants. Um, so you can add that as well, and it'll narrow down your population based on who has DNA in the central biorepository. And then here we have genetic data. So we have um, Again, next week, this should be all updated. It should also include freeze four that we're currently on, but it has um, MGI freeze three, all of our SARS-CoV-2 sequence data, um, anyone who's had whole exome sequencing or MIPS targeted sequencing, we have that. Um, and this works, so if you're interested in only MGI freeze three, and who have an overlap with a whole exome sequencing, you can do require all of the following, or you can do any of the following. So they can fall into either one of these categories. So it's a pretty nice um, filter, you know, how you can toggle through all of this. So as you see here on the right, we're left with 100 patients. If you go to cohort demographics, we should be able to get a quick demographic view on a, our patient breakdown. Um, and here you see age ranges, how they're broken down. 
uh, different comorbidities, how it's broken down, BMI, the different specimen that we have available on these 100 patients. Um, again, comorbidities, different insurance information, ethnicities, race, and then their preferred language. So all of this is in here. And then once we also have this geolocation overview filter, and this is part of our socioeconomic status data that we've made available. And you can compare your cohort of interest to, um, and this is specific to disadvantage index, to the ones in the United States and see if it's kind of fits within the same range. So about 10% of our cohort are um, disadvantaged, and if you see on the top, it says 34 patients out of our 100 um, fit the criteria of being in a disadvantaged neighborhood. Um, but again, you can compare it with the U.S. Neighborhood Disadvantage Index, as well as Michigan um, Disadvantage Index or um, Washtenaw County. And you can do the same thing with affluence index. So um, if we want to compare it to um, Michigan, for example, so our population is 40% affluent, um, where Michigan's is about 20%, you know, most affluent. And then you can do the same thing with education. So less than a high school diploma, 10% of our 100 part, you know, patients in our cohort um, have fit in the neighborhood with proportion with less than a high school diploma and same with ethnic immigrant concentrations. So then we go through and we want to actually download data on these patients. So we want to download, you know, um, structured data on these patients, clinical data. And um, if we go to demographics, you'll see a slew of views is what we call them, and you can get social history. So when you look at all of these different views, you'll see a de-identified de patient ID. This is how you can link all of the clinical data that you see available here on the left. So encounter data, diagnosis data, you can link them all with this patient ID. And then you'll see this de-identified encounter ID. So say for example, for a specific time that you were at the hospital, um, a set of data were collected about you or you had certain diagnosis for that specific encounter. You can link all of that with this encounter ID um, going through all these different data that's available. When you're looking at this, if it's uh, if you see this X and it's crossed out, that means you are not downloading the data. But if you click here on the example for, um, you can see, okay, now I'm also going to download observation context. This is very nice because it gives you an example of what, what the data looks like. So smoking status source, for example, it says current um, someday smoker or former smoker. Um, and you can see that for almost all of our va va variables. I see there is a question here. Sorry that I stopped. Oh, that's Chinsia. Okay, I won't read that then. Um, okay, so then we also have demographic info. So this is demographic information about our patient cohort of 100. Um, we can get gender name, date of birth, um, deceased date. Again, all of these dates have been de-identified and date shifted. And then um, things that aren't as identifiable, like race, name, um, ethnicity. Um, and again, you can see uh, examples here on what that data will look like once you download the data. And here we also have um, death index data. So these are the Michigan death index uh, data information that we have. For patients that not only died at Michigan Medicine, um, but that could have died at any facility at, in the state of Michigan. And then we have the neighborhood affluence index. So what populates our um, geolocation overview, you'll get the raw data here. And these are all um, in quartiles to protect the identifiability of the patient. And this, this is where you can also see our MGI ancestry for our Michigan Genomics Initiative patients. And you can download this data. If any of our uh, 100 patients are part of MGI, you'd be able to get that data. 
Okay, so then we have encounter information. So encounter, you'll be able to see every encounter that the patient had with the with U of M and its clinics. Um, you'd have admit date, discharge date, um, any insurance information that you're interested in, um, when they checked in, when they checked out. And again, you'll see information here. So was this a scheduled appointment? Was it an emergency appointment? Um, did they go to a facility after they were discharged? Did they go home? Um, you can see all this information. Um, this is encounter anthropometric. Again, as you see here, we have de-identified patient ID as well as de-identified encounter ID. And again, this is how you can link all of the different an encounter. So for example, um, for an encounter that you had today, we can link your height and weight with the encounter information that we get here with the diagnosis data that we can get from here. Um, and when we look at this diagnosis data, for example, I always like to check diagnosis comprehensive all that way you get all the diagnosis information and then you can narrow it down from there. Um, but you can click on these. Um, and you can select exactly what you're interested in downloading. Um, so there are five different diagnosis sources, which we pull diagnosis data from. Um, our documentation sites describes them very well. But if you're interested in only a specific diagnosis source, say, for example, I only want to know if they have um, a hernia in their Michigan in their medical history, we can select that and it'll only show it to us if it was in their medical history and not in their other diagnosis sources like a visit diagnosis or a problem summary list. And then here, these funnels is where we can. So right now, if you're looking at all this data, you would be downloading every single diagnosis that the, these 100 patients have ever had at U of M. Um, but if you only want a specific set of diagnoses that you want information on, um, you can say, okay, I just want um, hernia. So I only want information on only their hernia diagnoses and nothing else. So I can add those and I'll only be getting information about these diagnoses rather than all of their diagnoses and their patient's chart. So these funnels are very helpful in um, narrowing down your population. And then we also have any procedures. Um, again, these are any orders that have been put in, non-medication orders. So um, that's where you can get that. And again, these funnels are very helpful in narrowing down exactly what you're downloading rather than downloading everything. Um, and procedures comprehensive. So this is where you can get the name of the procedure that the patient had at that given encounter ID. Um, so it really does build a big picture of the clinical care that a patient has had. And again, these are the mother-child um, information that we have here. So here we have um, the patient ID, so the mother's ID, and then we have here the baby's ID, and this is how you can link um, mother and children together if they've given birth at U of M. And then we go through and this is medication. So any medications that were ordered. Um, and then this is when I mentioned medication sure script data. So this is any fulfillment data for the MGI cohort. Um, again, this does not include Kroger or Costco pharmacies. So it, it is a big hole for a very big number of pharmacies. Any labs that you're interested in and their results, you can go through here and get all of that information, those results. Um, any flow sheet information. So when a patient is in the hospital, um, they are constantly measuring vital signs or fluid output, input, any cardiovascular infu inf infusions that are being administered. You can also obtain all of that information here. And again, if you see here, you can link it to that specific encounter. And then this is where you can find all of our surveys. So these are our COVID-19 survey results. So all of our questions and responses. Um, nope. 
our FEQ survey, our MGI reported surveys, our baseline surveys are here, as well as our longitudinal surveys are in our um, de-identified RDW, because those are too big to expose here. What we're also going to add is um, questionnaires that patients are administered when they come into the hospital. And that is questionnaires on um, anxiety, depression, um, uh, there is a few other ones that I can't quite remember right now, but ones that, so for example, um, if they have access to transportation to coming in, if there is any violence in the house, any food insecurities, all of those questionnaires were all, will also be added to our self-serve tools in a couple of weeks. And then while I still have a few more minutes here, I do want to show you our documentation website. Um, you log in with your at UMish account and your level one password, and you will be able to see user guides. Our user guides are, you know, how to log into our uh, turbo environment, how to access it through our Linux environment or Yoda byte environment. Our Slurm guide here is, shows you how to connect to the GPUs. And these are all step-by-step -step guides on, you know, click start, click here, click there, the scripts that you need to put together in order to um, connect to our GPUs, for example. Our data dictionaries, um, these are very helpful when you're looking at all of our clinical data, especially if you're not um, comfortable with using clinical data at first, or if you're not comfortable, or if you haven't looked at our structured clinical data of our patients. But this gives you a contact description of the different view that you're pulling data from, um, the date range of when that data started to be in our system. Um, so for example, for diagnosis, we have it from 2006 and on. Um, there are different resources, the different sources that we pull the data from, different limitations of the data. And then it goes through every single column and description and the data type and the max length and all of that. Um, we are hoping to expand this with um, hopefully different examples and the different options um, that can be for each of these, but that's a very big undertaking for our um, colleague, Susan, that's putting all this documentation together. But And then you can also download it as a CSV. And then the glossary, again, this just gives you an overview of um, different definitions that we have available, what is diagnosis, the different diagnosis sources that we have available. Um, Anything that you don't see here, just let us know and we'll go ahead, define it and put it in here. And then our survey instruments, all the available documentation for our survey instruments. We're going to be adding a few more here shortly, um, but our survey instruments are definitely a lot to define since they have a lot of questions. And that's about it. And I see there's some chat questions in the chat. Is there a data dictionary along with a downloaded data set? Um, so again, you would have to come to our documentation website and you'd be able to pull all the, um, you know, the columns that go along with that data that you downloaded. Oh, and Anita already answered that. Thanks, Anita. Great. Thank you. Yeah, um, of course. So that was a lot of stuff. Um, and as you can see, there's, there's a lot of data there and sort of playing around there and figuring out what you actually want is probably going to take a little bit. Um, but it's a lot of data that's there for free. So if you have a cool question, um, Anissa or anyone else of us would be happy to help you get going there. Are there any more questions that came up either online or here in the room? Uh, there is one from online. Okay. Um, can we transfer download data between Yotabyte and Omnis 2? So you, you mentioned about two methods. And is there a way to transfer the download data from one type to the other one? So you, would, you could access the data in whichever environment that you're interested in. So whenever the data gets downloaded into our environment, it's downloaded to a specific Hume number, so your IRB number, and then you can analyze it in whichever environment you're interested in or most comfortable in. Any 
Any other questions? Great. Well, thanks for sticking it out with us. And thank uh, you very much. And this is very helpful. And uh, Lisa gave a very comprehensive presentation. And also, we think we would like to thank Xiang and uh, Sebastian for their presentations too. And let's give them a big applause. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a good one, everyone. We'll be in touch. Have a nice weekend. Yeah. Bye.